Welcome to this course on Practical Abstracts and Text Trees, or ASTs. Originally, when I was faced with making a change that affected hundreds of files in a code base, I would question whether or not it was critical to make that change. If it was, I would then slowly go through each file and make that update. This would often take a long time and could be error prone. After doing this several times, I learned ASTs unlock the ability to automate a lot of repetitive or challenging tasks like this in a much more reliable way. In the process, I also realized that ASTs have a much broader application than only refactoring. This course aims to distill the time I spent struggling through the documentation in a way I wish I could have learned about abstract syntax trees and their various applications in the front-end web ecosystem. When seeing or hearing the term AST, it's tempting to ignore it because it seems either irrelevant to the work you're doing or it just sounds way too complex. After this course, hopefully you'll understand that neither of these statements are true. First, ASTs are more common than you may think, and are used in many examples of software such as Webpack, Babel, and Prettier. Second, ASTs can seem complex due to their vocabulary, tooling, or documentation. However, this course will take an AST-first approach. This way, we'll first acquire a strong understanding of ASTs, then we'll start to interact with ASTs, and then finally we'll start to explore the tooling available for using ASTs in a practical way. This way, your AST knowledge can be applied to any AST-based tool. This course will start by covering the fundamentals of ASTs, what they are, and how they work. Once we're comfortable with ASTs, we'll start to explore several practical use cases, including code audits or static analysis to understand the current state of source code, code transforms or code mods to transform source code from one state to another, and finally code linting or rules to prevent certain patterns from appearing in source code. Most courses will build an app along the way, but we'll use a sample app because this course is aimed at practical uses of ASTs for maintaining and refactoring code bases. This course is for anyone who has ever needed to maintain or refactor a large code base. This course is primarily written in JavaScript and TypeScript and works on a JavaScript code base. Many of the concepts in the course are not JavaScript or TypeScript specific, but many of the tools will be specific to these languages. Let's get started. The first lesson will dive into understanding ASTs and how they work. What is an AST? This course is designed to provide a concrete understanding of the theory and practical uses of abstracts and text trees, or ASTs. Before we explore the practical uses, we need to gain a conceptual understanding of ASTs. At a high level, an abstract syntax tree is an intermediate representation of source code as a tree structure. But what does that actually mean? Let's break each part of the statement down. To start, let's look at the tree data structure. A tree data structure starts with a root node. The root can then point to other values, and those values to others, and so on. This begins to create an implicit hierarchy, and also happens to be a great way to represent source code in a way computers can easily interpret. Each one of these values, or circles in the tree, are referred to as nodes. The relationships between nodes are often described with terms like child node, parent node, sibling node, and so on. By convention, the root node is shown at the top. However, if it's flipped, with the root node at the bottom and the rest of the tree heading upwards, it starts to look like an actual tree, with all its branches forking out. Tree data structures are common in computer science and have many practical applications, such as searching and sorting data. There are also many different types of trees with different constraints. For example, a binary tree is a tree with at most two child nodes. For the purpose of working with ASTs, the important aspect is understanding how a tree can be used to represent data in the relationships between nodes. Some of the most prominent uses of ASTs are in compilers. A compiler accepts source code as input, and then outputs another language. This is often from a high-level programming language to something low-level, like machine code. In the front-end web ecosystem, this includes tools like Webpack or Parcel. These tools compile many modules into a bundle and perform other optimizations such as transpiling from modern JavaScript to an older version, or minifying the code by renaming variables and functions to shorter names. Although they are a little different to conventional compilers, they follow many of the same fundamental steps. Compilers are commonly broken down into two parts, the front-end and back-end. The front-end is responsible for scanning and parsing the source code, while the back-end is responsible for producing the output. One benefit of making this distinction is the ability to combine a different front-end and back-end, depending on the input language being compiled and the desired output language. Additionally, breaking this process down into distinct steps makes it easier to reason about. In order for this to work, the front-end and back-end need some form of protocol, 
or an intermediate representation of the input. Typically, the output of the front end is an abstract syntax tree. The AST represents the source code in a tree structure, hence a syntax tree. It's considered abstract because at this point, it has abstracted away syntax that is irrelevant when represented by a tree, since it can imply things like hierarchy. While ASTs can seem complex, most of the complexity is in generating them from source code. Fortunately, there are many great tools in the JavaScript ecosystem that can handle generating ASTs. For the remainder of this course, it won't be critical to know the nuances of compilers, or all the different types of tree data structures, or the complexities of generating ASTs. However, understanding what ASTs are will unlock a whole new set of practical skills. For example, some common applications of ASTs include counting how many times a function, variable, component, or prop is used in source code, or transforming code from one syntax to another, or enforcing rules for syntax or other static analysis, for example, disallowing unused variables. Once familiar with abstract syntax trees, many of these concepts can be carried from one tool to another, as they will be built on many of the same fundamentals. Now that we have a base understanding of what ASTs are and how they work, what does a basic AST look like in practice? Let's take the following line of JavaScript as an example input. This code can then be represented by the following abstract syntax tree on the right. You'll notice there is a single root node. Here, that's the addition operator. In practice, the root node represents the entire file, but for the purpose of this example, unnecessary nodes have been omitted. Each child node, for example the numeric literal 2, has one unique parent. This can be said for all other nodes in the tree except the root. Finally, the tree structure implies hierarchy, which means syntax such as parentheses can be omitted. For example, to evaluate this tree, the multiplication must occur before the addition. Looking at a visual AST like this can be a helpful way to understand the structure. However, this isn't the true representation of what an AST will be when working with it in later lessons. A more common format is to represent this abstract syntax tree in a JSON format. Using the same example code, a simplified JSON structure representing the AST can be seen on the right. Most tooling that relies on ASTs operate on a JSON structure like this. As the tree becomes larger and more complex, it can become harder to visualize the structure. Take a moment to relate the visual representation and this JSON format of the same tree. Visualizing source code in a tree structure like this is one technique that can be helpful when reasoning about ASTs. Here, the entire statement is considered a binary expression node with three primary properties, left, operator, and right. The left node is then a numeric literal node representing the value 2. The right node, however, is yet another binary expression node, again with the properties left, operator, and right. However, this time, this nested binary expressions left and right nodes are both numeric literals representing the values 4 and 10. Now that we conceptually understand ASTs, the next lesson will cover what they look like in more depth. Manually exploring an AST is a helpful exercise in understanding the relevant subtree and its nodes which represent a given piece of code. Understanding the relevant nodes is the first step to being able to automatically or programmatically traverse an AST. AST Explorer is one of the simplest ways to begin exploring real ASTs. It provides a UI on top of many tools and a way to interactively explore ASTs. This helps make ASTs more digestible by highlighting the relationship between the source code and specific nodes of the AST. To give this a try, we'll go to astexplore.net and put in the same piece of sample code from the previous lesson. There are a few views and settings AST Explorer provides in the top menu. First, there are the languages. For this course, the language can always be set to JavaScript because all of the example code we're parsing is JavaScript. The parser option will need to be changed throughout the course depending on the exact tool being looked at. For now, using Babel Parser is a good default, and many of the first lessons will use this as the parser. This setting controls which parser is used to generate the AST. The final AST can differ depending on which parser is selected. Remember to switch the parser to match the tool being used in later lessons, otherwise the generated tree in AST Explorer can have subtle and confusing differences. Next to this parser option is a gear icon. 
Clicking this controls the options for the selected parser. For example, pasting in something like TypeScript code would require enabling the TypeScript plugin and disabling the flow plugin, but the defaults are fine for this case. The left pane is the code editor. This is where any relevant code can be typed or pasted. Typically, it's easiest to keep the code as short as possible to keep the generated AST small, so it's easier to explore. The resulting AST for the code snippet will be generated invisible on the right. Each node in the tree can be expanded or collapsed. Arguably the best feature is the ability to click on the source code to highlight the exact node in the tree view. Clicking the node in the tree view will also highlight the relevant code in the editor. For example, clicking 4 in the code editor will highlight the numeric literal node in the tree view. Or, hovering over the numeric literal node with a value of 10 in the tree view will highlight the number 10 in the code editor. Alternatively, the entire generated tree can be viewed as static JSON by toggling the JSON tab to the right of the tree tab. The tree view also exposes several other settings. For example, the location data, which defines the lines and columns where the code originally appeared in the source, isn't frequently used. The hide location data option can be enabled to hide this data in the nodes to make it easier to explore. Hide empty keys will hide keys with undefined values. These settings are necessary, but can make it easier to focus on the important pieces. Take a moment to explore ASTs generated for other code. For example, maybe paste a snippet of code from one of your projects, or consider pasting a snippet of code from an open source repo. Otherwise, maybe try different types of syntax, such as spread syntax, knowledge coalescing, or optional chaining. AST Explorer is a helpful tool when trying to understand the AST for a given piece of source code. Keep it handy to paste in any pieces of code that come up through the course, and remember to double check the settings. We now have a base understanding of what an AST is and how to manually explore one. The next lesson will cover some of the tooling that exists in the JavaScript ecosystem for working with ASTs. ASTs are not unique to JavaScript, but there is a robust ecosystem of JavaScript-specific AST tooling available. You may even be familiar with some of them, or already use some of them on a regular basis. This lesson will quickly cover some examples of the JavaScript-specific tooling that either rely on, interface with, or expose ASTs. ESLint is a JavaScript code linter. It provides a way to define rules for the code to follow. It relies on converting the source code into an AST and then traversing the nodes to verify there are no violations. This means if you're familiar with ASTs, it's possible to create custom linting rules. This will be covered in more depth later in the course. Babel is a JavaScript compiler. It's commonly used to transpile new JavaScript features to backwards compatible JavaScript. It provides several packages to work with code at different steps. For example, Babel Parser converts a string of code into an AST, or Babel Generator converts an AST back into a string of code. This will also be covered in more depth later in the course. JS CodeShift is specialized tooling for transforming JavaScript. This is primarily used for one-off code transformations when a breaking change is made across large code bases. For example, all the React code mods are built with JS CodeShift. This will also be covered later in the course. Terser, a JavaScript parser and compressor, or minifier. Finally, Prettier, an opinionated code formatter. It relies on ASTs for formatting source code. This is only a short list of some of the tools available that work with ASTs in some way in the JavaScript ecosystem. The remainder of this course will dive into a few of these, looking at how they can be used in practice. Many of the concepts can be carried from one tool to another, since they're all based on ASTs. This lesson quickly covers some of the environment tooling used throughout the rest of the course. If you're comfortable using replacements, for example, yarn instead of NPM, feel free to make those adjustments. This course was created with Node version 12 and NPM version 6. However, any recent version should be sufficient. A quick way to check your version is to run Node-V in your terminal. 
If you don't already have Node and NPM installed, follow the steps for installing them using a Node version manager. This allows you to install multiple versions of Node and seamlessly switch between different versions. Any editor should be sufficient for this course. However, I will be using VS Code because it has great TypeScript support. Similarly, any terminal should be sufficient to run the scripts with Node, such as iTerm2 on Mac or Windows Terminal on Windows. Now that we have a base understanding of ASTs, some of the ecosystem and tools we'll need, the next lesson will dive into generating ASTs. Now that we have an understanding of what abstract syntax trees are, we can start generating ASTs from source code and programmatically traverse through the different nodes in the tree. When previously looking at AST Explorer, the parser option was set to Babel Parser. This is a package that's available on NPM, which means it can be installed and used to parse any source code string into an AST. At a high level, Babel is a JavaScript compiler commonly used to transpile modern JavaScript syntax to compatible but older JavaScript syntax. This allows early adoption of new syntax and features before there is sufficient browser support. It has a robust plugin system that can be used to add support for many different syntaxes. For example, the optional chaining plugin. This adds support for optional chaining syntax, which is new syntax that isn't widely supported by browsers yet. This will transpile this new syntax into equivalent but older syntax. Or the React JSX plugin, which adds support for JSX, which is XML-like syntax and not intended to be implemented by browsers. This plugin transpiles the syntax to an equivalent and supported syntax, specifically functions and objects, before it can be ran in the browser. And the final example is the TypeScript plugin. It adds support for TypeScript syntax, specifically static types. This plugin strips the types and does other transformations to transpile to valid JavaScript. These are only a few of the many plugins that Babel supports. Babel performs these transpilations by converting the source code into an AST. It manipulates the nodes and converts the manipulated AST back into source code. These plugins can extend and modify the parsing and generating of the AST. This means it's also possible to write custom plugins. The Babel core package wraps up most of this functionality in a single package with minimal configuration. However, Babel also exposes the different internal operations and functionality in a series of packages. We'll be using several of these packages in this lesson and throughout the rest of the course. The Babel parser package parses a source code string into an AST. The Babel traverse package allows us to traverse different types of nodes within an AST. The Babel generator package converts an AST back into a source code string. The Babel Types package creates new nodes to add or replace existing nodes in an AST. All of these lower level packages can be used to create flexible custom scripts to parse, generate, and manipulate ASTs. To get started, we'll focus on the Babel Parser package to parse the previous code snippet into an AST. First, create a new Babel Parser demo directory. Then change into that new directory. Next, we'll initialize a new package.json file. And finally, we're going to install the Babel parser package. Now we can open this project in our editor. Next, create a parser.js file that we'll use to execute the parser on the source code. First, import the parse function from Babel parser. Then, we can create a variable with the same example code from previous lessons. Now we can use the parse function to parse the code into an AST. Now that we have the AST, let's print it. Switch back to your terminal, and now we can run this with Node. We can see that this printed the same AST. This AST is a single file node with several properties. One of the properties is program, which is a program node. This program node also has several properties, one of which is body. The body property is an array that can contain various types of nodes. This is where the nodes that represent the code we parsed will be. Note that ASTs are deeply nested, so the output is truncated after a few levels. Let's switch back to our editor, and we can update the script to log the first node in the body of the program to see the part of the tree that represents the example code. As we just saw, the AST had a program property, 
which itself had a body property, which is an array of nodes. And we want to specifically look at the first node in that body array. Now we can switch back to our terminal and run this again. This time, the parser script only printed the first node in the program body, which is an expression statement. This node has an expression property, which itself is a binary expression. A binary expression node has three important properties, left, operator, and right. In this case, the operator is the addition sign. The left property is a numeric literal node with the value of two. However, the right property itself is another binary expression node. This second binary expression operator is a multiplication sign. In both its left and right properties, each point to a numeric literal node representing four and 10. Compare this output with what you saw in AST Explorer. AST Explorer and this script are both using the Babel parser package, so the output should be identical, assuming all of the configuration is the same. Now that we know how this part of the tree looks, let's update the script to print only the first binary expression's left numeric literal value, which is 2. The script is already printing only the expression statement. As seen earlier, the expression property is a binary expression which has a left property that is a numeric literal node. The numeric literal node then has a value property with a value of 2. Now we can switch back to our terminal and run the script again. This time, only the value 2 is printed. Instead of logging only the leftmost value, take a few moments to try to update the parser script to log all of the numeric values in the expression, 2, 4, 10. For now, assume the tree never changes. In the next lesson, we'll explore how to do this in a programmatic way to handle any arbitrary tree. In the previous lesson, we wanted to log all of the numeric values in the source code. This lesson will continue to build on that, but explore how to do it in a more generic way. The resulting script may have looked something like this. We had three print statements, one for each of the numeric values in the tree. However, what would happen if the order of operations was swapped in the source code to do the addition first, then multiplication? Changing the order of operations like this will result in a different AST. Previously, 4 and 10 were multiply first then added to 2. Now, 2 and 4 are added first, then multiplied with 10. We can see that this new equation produces a different tree from the previous lesson. Now, the new tree has a binary expression on the left and a numeric literal on the right. This time, the first binary expression node has another binary expression node on the left instead of the right, and a numeric literal node on the right instead of the left. Additionally, its operator is now a multiplication sign. Each type of node only defines properties relevant to what it represents. For example, a binary expression node has an operator property to indicate either addition or multiplication. However, a numeric literal node does not have an operator property since it represents only a number, but it does have a value property, which a binary expression does not. Each property can have several different types of values. For example, the numeric literal value property is always a number whereas the binary expression left and right properties are always another node. As seen in this example, the left and right properties can be more than one type of node, in this case either numeric literal or another binary expression. The parser script made assumptions about the structure of the tree and the types of nodes. It assumed the first binary expression had another binary expression in the right property, and that that binary expression had a numeric literal in the left property. Looking at the new tree, we can see this is no longer the case. Now, the binary expression's right property will return a numeric literal node instead of another binary expression node. Then, trying to access the left property will return undefined since left doesn't exist on a numeric literal node. And finally, trying to access the value of that undefined value will throw a runtime error. Now, let's switch to our terminal and run the script and see if that's the case. We can see that this line indeed did throw a runtime error as we expected. In order to fix this issue, we need to make our script more flexible. We need a way to generically visit a specific type of node in the tree, wherever in the hierarchy it may be. We want our script to be more flexible in order to handle any AST, or in other words, any source code input. The Babel Traverse package offers the functionality to programmatically visit nodes anywhere in the tree. 
In our case, we want to visit the nodes that represent a numeric literal. We'll continue with the existing project from the previous lesson, and we'll get started by first installing the Babel Traverse package. Then, we'll switch back to our editor and create a new traverse.js file that's a copy of parser.js with one new import for the traverse function from the Babel Traverse package. The parse method is a named export from the Babel parser package, but the traverse function is the default export of the Babel Traverse package. And we can also remove the print statements. The traverse function expects an AST as the first argument, which we've already generated with the Babel parser package. The second argument is an object of visitors. Each key in the object is the type of node to traverse or visit. Each key's value is a function invoked for each node of that type in the AST, also known as a visitor. The traverse function will visit each node in the AST. For each node, if there is a visitor defined for that node's type, it will be invoked with the node wrapped in a path object. The underlying AST node can be accessed via the node property on path. ASTs consist only of nodes but most tooling will pass a path object to visitor functions. It's a wrapper around the node it represents with some additional helpful metadata, such as a reference to the parent node. Terminology like this is why ASTs can seem complex. It's helpful to be familiar with these terms since most tooling and documentation will use them, but it's more important to understand the concepts. The actual code for this case is fairly simple. We want to find all numeric literal nodes in the AST. So we've defined a visitor for nodes of that type. Now let's run the script to see what this prints. The script printed all of the numeric literal value nodes, but we only want to print the values. We can switch back to our editor and update the visitor function for numeric literal nodes and only print the nodes value. Now running the script will produce the same output as the parser that manually printed these values. Unlike the previous script, it will handle any source code and won't throw a runtime error. The output order is maintained because Traverse will visit nodes depth first. Additionally, Traverse will invoke the visitor when traversing down the tree or on enter. It's also possible to define a visitor that will be invoked when visiting the node when going back up the tree or on exit. Let's quickly define a visitor for numeric literal nodes that will print on both enter and exit. Running the script again will now print twice for each node. In this case, all of the numeric literal nodes are leaf nodes or don't have any children. So the exit will be invoked immediately following the enter. Changing when we visit a node won't be necessary for any of the examples in this course, but it can be a helpful technique depending on the use case. We can revert to the original visitor function for now. Take a few moments to try updating the source code input with several different equations, and notice how this approach can handle any potential input now. I'll quickly paste in a new equation and show how it prints all of the numeric literal nodes in the equation. After you've tried a few different equations, try updating the script to print only the operators instead of the numeric literals. The expected output for the original source code example would be the addition sign and then the multiplication sign. Make sure that it too can handle any equation. If at any point you get stuck, don't forget about AST Explorer. Once you've updated the script, take a moment to consider how you would have found all the numeric values or operators with a traditional search tool or find and replace tool. This example is simplified, but you might imagine doing something similar if you wanted to know all the usages of X in a code base. The next module will begin to explore how these types of questions can be answered with ASTs. Before that, the next lesson will quickly cover one more tip for creating custom traversal scripts. In the previous lesson, the initial script for logging the numeric values worked for one specific code snippet. Updating that to another code snippet resulted in a runtime error because the underlying AST changed. The first step we took was to use the Babel Traverse package, 
which allowed us to more generically visit nodes within the tree. Ideally, this issue with the initial script would have been caught before the script was even ran. Fortunately, many of these issues can be caught in your editor or at compile time with TypeScript. The type definitions define all of the nodes in each node's specific properties. This means only valid properties can be accessed. Additionally, since many properties can be polymorphic or point to many other types of nodes, it requires narrowing the type to only the nodes with that property defined. This results in many more runtime checks and an overall more robust script leading to fewer runtime errors. You can think of the AST that the type definitions represent as the most generic AST, since it represents every possible node and property. Keep in mind that TypeScript is not a requirement for any of this, but it does help avoid runtime errors and provides code completion, which makes it easier to work with complex nodes. So the rest of this course will continue to use TypeScript for our scripts.